This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs, the playbook. And when I say the word entrepreneur, it is talking about Alex Machinsky, founder and CEO of Celsius Network. Alex, welcome to the playbook. Hi, David. Good to be with you again. You know, it's so funny because we were just talking about entrepreneurs. And, you know, when we grew up, not that we're still not growing up, but when we were younger and growing up, uh, it was not... There was no superhero entrepreneurs. They're really like today I'm amazed, like people stop me, take my picture, you know, want to sign book. And I'm thinking, when did, you know, I become Warren Moon, my business partner, that kids look up to entrepreneurs as if they're superheroes. But there was a few of us that were inspired by things like Entrepreneur Magazine. magazine. And, you know, we were looking at, you know, some of the guys that dropped out of Harvard and, and, and wanted to know, you know, how and what made them tick. I will tell you, you know, after getting to meet you and learning about your experience with voice over IP, which I had a lot of experience with in, in being CEO of Samsung's phone division, but now Celsius Network, there is something uh, either wrong with you and I or born into you and I that attract us to the true entrepreneur, the people that must be what they can be so they can help people make money, help people in general and have fun. Where was your first indoctrination to the heroism of entrepreneurship or the romantic side of entrepreneurship? Yeah, so I totally agree with you. I think, uh, you know, I came to the United States as an immigrant back in uh, 1988, and I used to still do read Entrepreneur Magazine, Success Magazine, Forbes, Fortune, I, every magazine I could read. And uh, it's true that back, back in the day before the internet, uh, boom, uh, entrepreneurship was mostly like a oil tycoon or Fred Smith uh, built the FedEx, you know, so these were like monolithic companies that it took people 30, 50 years to build, right? And after the internet, everybody could become an entrepreneur. Everybody was an internet success story. So the, like the duration, the amount of time that it took to build a unicorn or a company worth over a billion dollars just shrank from like 30 years to like basically 10 years to five years. Now they now we have one-year-old babies that are already, uh, companies that already are <laughs> worth more than a billion dollars. So uh, so definitely it's, it's, it's something that every teenager thinks that they're, they deserve it. They deserve to be an entrepreneur. They deserve to do a unicorn. Yeah, and to that matter, you know, it still takes a lot of experience and unicorns are called unicorns. Uh, because for every one unicorn, there's millions of other companies that fall within the spectrum of, uh, you know, semi making it, making it, not making it somewhere along that spectrum. But there's a certain perspective that all entrepreneurs have, whether it's a unicorn in one year or struggling in the 17th year. I, you know, coach several entrepreneurs and, you know, I know they're very close, but it's been a 17 year journey uh, to, to get to where they are today. For you, what are some of the characteristics of perspective that have allowed you to continually look at things differently. You, voice over IP obviously is a complete game changer. Uh, you know, I'm blessed. And I have to say voice over IP because I was with uh, the host of the Rise of the Young, Casey Adams, who I mentor. And I said, I'm so excited. I have Alex on my podcast. And I said, he, he's like the CEO of Celsius Network. I goes, yeah. I go, but he, you know, literally invented VoIP. I mean, he's the first. And he goes, what's VoIP? And I'm thinking these kids, it's like when they asked me, I said, you got to have the attitude of Rudy. And they're like, who's Rudy? It's killing me, Alex. Uh, but what are the characteristics of perception uh, that has allowed you to continually create these earth changing? And when I say earth changing, they really are types of technologies and platforms that allow us to do so much more today. Yeah, so, so I do have a, a unique skill that, uh, that I managed to kind of hone over the years, which is really kind of the ability to project yourself into the future and ask yourself, okay, what does the future look like five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now? And, and, uh, uh, and, and really hit on the drivers or the things that are going to be important. So like right now, uh, with Celsius, I'm working on money over IP. What does money look like 5, 10, 15 years from now? And how are we transacting? Are we still working with banks? Are we still work using credit cards? Or is it looks uh, completely different? So if you can imagine that future, 
then you can bring everybody into that future. You're basically sharing that future with people. And then you have early adopters, you have people who love kind of tinkering with technology and they might be coming in and playing in your sandbox. And then you, you want to get to that mass adoption. You want to get many, many people uh, to use your invention. So like uh, we use voice of IP right now, right? We don't even think about it. The kids, you know, my, my, my son, you know, he plays, uh, uh, you know, all these games and Minecraft and all these other games. And they're, they have a multiplayer setup. It's all voice of IP. And I explained to him, you know, your dad worked on like doing one channel was hard. Forget about talking to eight of your friends at the same time. Uh, while you're playing your game. Uh, and, and, and so you have to imagine that future. You have to imagine a future in which gaming, video communication was free, abundant, and available to everybody. So, so uh, and I think, I truly think that, that each one of us is a unique experiment, right? The, the, every human is a different, is something that will never be recreated again. And each human has a unique skill. You are a superhuman in one thing, that you can do better than anybody else. The problem we have is that most of us don't get to find that skill. We, we, our parents tell us, oh, I want you to be an engineer or a doctor or, or whatever, a mechanic or whatever. And you get slotted into that. Uh, 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 and you're not passionate about it, right? You're not really living your dream because you spent five years studying a profession and you can't really do what you want to do. And most of us, you hear that again and again, right? You want to be successful. You have to follow your dream. And then you never work a day in your life. And like, I can see the passion in your voice, David, when you talk, because you love sharing with other people, right? You love uh, uh, educating people and, and, and it comes through. So the same way with, with entrepreneurship. If you are passionate about something, other people see it and they want to help you. They want to follow you. They want to join you. They want to invest in you and you become successful. So it's almost like a self propelling prophecy. If you're not happy about something, then you're projecting negative energy and you don't, you're not, you become not successful. So that's really, it's a self, the journey is uh, self-fulfilling. Yeah. And it's not, like you said, just people that don't like you. It's people that love you too much. You know, our Jewish mothers of saying doctor, lawyer, failure. I always say, mom, stop loving me so much because you're so afraid for me. I don't want any of that fear. I, I don't want what you want for me. I want you to be happy, but I also want to be happy. And I want what I want for myself. I want not what's missing or what I don't want. And I see so many people focusing on that, uh, you know, the wrong things. Um, to that end as well, you know, you have re-engineered uh, an old institution, our financial institution. And the older an institution, I find the more... Uh, unintentionally, it becomes manipulative. It just, the natural flow of money turns into services and fees. And uh, they, you know, really start, I think with good intention, the, the big banks that we have uh, to help people uh, to work through that monolithic, humongous glacier moving type of institution, it loses its purpose. And you are someone I think that not only has vision, but you're purpose driven. You start looking at Wow. And this time around, I mean, you've raised over a billion. I think you've exited for over three billion. You know, you put your own money where your mouth is. And uh, it's almost as if you built a bus, you became the bus driver. And then you said, whoever wants to jump on my bus can come onto my bus. And here we are. Uh, and I think if I got my numbers correctly, because it's blowing me away, that it's, you know, your bus is now cruising along in over 150 countries. You processed over eight. $0.2 billion in loans. I think some of the states are giving you uh, some uh, feedback because they can't afford for you to do business in their state because you're doing things so efficiently, you're putting their banks out of business. Um, you know, what exactly did you see in banking that was, you know, either unintentionally or intentionally usury or unfair? And how have you rectified it with the new MOIP with money over IP? Sure. Yeah. So, so look, banking, the joke is that uh, I practice uh, to picking up a fight with the phone company so I can really go and pick up and, and pick the big fight with the bank. You know? right. so, <laughs> so the banks, you know, in, in, in downtown in every, in every city, the largest building, the most beautiful building is the bank, you know, the big name on top. And, and, and you have to ask yourself, how can they afford to be so rich and so powerful 
And most of it comes from not paying you anything for your money. So uh, most, of, most people don't understand how easy it is to make money from money. It's much harder to make money from good. Making something, selling it for more than you made it for, that's actually much harder than it is from just yielding or creating income uh, on money. And that's what banks do, right? So, so banks used to be good institutions, your community bank, your, your uh, you know, like your local uh, uh, thrift that, that used to basically uh, help local people, right? They, 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 your bank manager knew you, he probably bought bread at, at your local bakery and so on and so on. None of that exists anymore, right? I mean, no one, no one in the banking system knows who you are. So what happened is, as you said, over time, one CEO after the next uh, had to deliver more profits for their, to their shareholders. And they asked themselves, okay, well, where, if I have to deliver more and more, bigger and bigger dividends and bigger and bigger bonuses to my employees, where am I going to take it from? Well, I'm going to take it from my customers. So what happened is uh, uh, every few years, what the banks pay customers or, or give back to customers decreased. You don't even get the toaster. It used to be when you open an account, they gave you a toaster or, you know, you don't even get that anymore. And, and they gave more and more to the shareholders. So banks are the most profitable they've ever been. So they can pay us four, five, 6% for our money. They just don't want to, they don't have to, right? So what Celsius has done is said, wait a second, what happens if we take the same thing ben do, banks do and we give most of that value back to the customer, which is heresy in the banking world, right? I mean, we're, we are basically breaking the rules. And, and, and the beauty of the model and, and our slogan in the company is do good and then do well, is that banks are trading at very low multiple, 10, 12 times earnings. But companies like ours, they're growing super fast. They're trading at very high multiples, 30, 40, 50 times. Look at Amazon, right? And other companies. So what do you want to be? You want to be the company that trades at low multiple or high multiple? So the beauty of our model is that we do good. We give all of this yield. We paid over $800 million to the community, right? In yield, in, in, in income. And at the same time, we get a higher valuation. We get to be a unicorn very quickly because uh, investors look at our company and say, look how fast they're growing. They're managing over 20 billion in assets. They have over a million customers. We're going to make them very, very valuable, right? So if you look at Uber or you look at uh, many other companies that grew super fast, uh, they did that while losing billions of dollars. Celsius is doing it while being profitable, which is unheard of, right? And you can only do it in the money business because money makes money, right? And you can basically earn yield. And then the question is, who are you giving that yield to? That is, it comes down to just that, <laughs> you know? And, so, and that yield is big. I mean, explain to everyone, you know, the differences between if I put $100,000 into my checking and savings account uh, to utilize to buy and, and sell things, I guess, uh, compared to being able to utilize uh, the Celsius network uh, with the same amount of money, what would the yield be in the difference be between traditional and cel Celsius network? Right. So first we pay the same percentage, right? We pay the same yield to somebody who has a hundred dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, right? So I'm the largest uh, user of Celsius. I have over $300 million on the platform. That's not money I invested in the company. This is Assets I gave Celsius to manage on my behalf. Why? They pay me 8.8%. I mean, that's amazing, right? Like you can't get anything close to that from any bank. It's so, the opposite so, of loan sharking. <laughs> exactly. So, exactly. So, so, uh, so I think Marcus, which is the Goldman Sachs product, is the highest yield account, 0.5%, half of 1%. Now, if you look at and Goldman that's for $100 as a company- and up, and, and what's your biggest deposit? You were telling me it's even, I mean, it's not 100,000, well, so nothing. I'm the largest user, I'm the largest user. I think after me, there's like somebody with 25 million, then somebody less than 10. But it doesn't matter, $100, you still get the same yield. Same yield, exactly. The beauty of our network is that we pay everybody the same. Like we don't, and you know, like you, and it's like this to open an account. It's not like going to a bank and, what is your employment and, and employment verification and all kind of other stuff. You do KYC, you just show your driving license. We have to do it by law. And then 
we, you get to earn yield on Bitcoin, on Ethereum, on stable coins and so on. So we, we can't take dollars, we're not a bank, but we accept uh, 45 different uh, digital assets, right? Stable coins are just one form of digital assets. So, so what we've decided to do is earn as much as possible, but not take a lot of risk and then give most of that to the users, to our community, right? That's the, the business the company's in. And again, a year ago, just a year ago, we had a billion in assets. Now we have over 25 billion. So, I mean, it's just crazy growth in one year. And like you said, many uh, regulators and many banks are looking and saying, wait a second, you know, this money is just draining out of our system and it's going into crypto, it's going into stable coins. And, and a lot of people confuse this because they say, well, I don't, I don't want to own Bitcoin. I think it's risky. Stable coins are, have nothing to do with Bitcoin. They are just dollars that are turned into digital form and they're earning you 8.8%. You're not touching Bitcoin. You're not buying Bitcoin. You're not selling Bitcoin. When you withdraw it, you get US dollars. So, and, and these stable coins are issued by trust companies. So it's similar to what uh, it used to be. You know, you used to have either a, uh, community bank or trust bank in your local neighborhood. Now those institutions give you digital dollars and you can use those digital dollars to earn interest. So like Circle is one, Coinbase, uh, Paxos, Gemini, and so on. These are the issuers of the stable coins. And how do you borrow since you have so much in loans? How are people borrowing money, uh, not just earning interest or yield? Right, so, so we make money from rehypothecation or lending out, right? And, and that's kind of like the secret that the most large uh, uh, Wall Street firms make most of their money, like BlackRock, one of the largest asset managers, more than half of their income comes from uh, rehypothecation or, or SEC lending. So Celsius does the same thing, but with digital assets. And we basically uh, issue loans and we pay uh, uh, again, the community from the income from those loans, but you, as a user, you can also apply for a loan. So you can, if you have assets with us, we only lend against collateral. The collateral is digital assets. If you have Bitcoin or Ethereum with us, you can take a 1% loan, 1% per year, right? So if you borrowed the $100,000, it would be $1,000 per year in interest, which is obviously the lowest rate you can get from anybody. And uh, uh, you don't have to sell the asset, right? So you're deferring your uh, capital gains. You are, you are basically doing what the very, very rich people do. Like when you see Jeff Bezos, so there was this article in Wall Street Journal that the five richest people in the United States did not pay any taxes. They just borrow against their assets. And, and that's what they do, right? So now you can do the same thing and you can do it digitally on your app. Just download the wallet, the Celsius wallet. Yeah, and it's a great strategy on you know income-based lending where you have an asset that is income-based uh, because you could replenish that asset and pay back the loan and actually hedge from the 8.85 to the 1% uh, and still make money by having the capital available to, to purchase things. So uh, this is, you know, the Rockefellers utilized it in IULs and life insurance for years, borrowing against policies in the exact same way. Um, and you've been able to aggregate and assimilate all of this incredible information and experience from the days of the technology of VoIP. I, I just see so many pieces and parts of what you've learned. And, you know, as much as, you know, a lot of the younger uh, generation have their you know, finger on the pulse of the technology, uh, you know, please everyone, human nature never changes. And those with extreme experience and success are great sources uh, in which we can learn from, which is why, you know, Alex, I, I really wanted to have you on here. Last question real quick, and I have to ask you because you're one, one of my entrepreneurial superheroes now, and I am uh, shamelessly promoting you to, I ask everyone, have you met Alex? You know my, my man, the Moip, uh, and uh, because I can't believe you and I have not run into each other somewhere along the line, but here's the ultimate question. Forget about Moip, forget about Celsius Network, forget about making money, helping people and having fun. I think the best question I can ask you for entrepreneurs is what is your philosophy of life? What is life about for you when you're capable of doing what you're capable of doing and helping so many people? Well, so I would say my first like 50 years was all about like trying to have success, right? Uh, 
having exit, accumulating some wealth, building a family. I have six kids uh, at home, and 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 after after you reach that, you basically realize that the guy like I was passing that graveyard in Queens. Every time I would go to the airport, I would just pass the giant graveyard, and I would like look at all those uh, uh, tombstones, and I would say to myself. Is any of those people, does it say on their tombstones, I died with this and this much money, you know? And obviously no one wants that written, even if you have a lot of money, that's the last thing you want written on your tombstone. So, so what you start caring about in the second half of your life is more about giving back and about uh, uh, your legacy and things like that. And, and you know, as again, as an immigrant, I came to this country without nothing, seriously, without nothing. My parents don't come from means they also immigrated from the Ukraine. So, so, uh, so for me, it was, okay, you got this opportunity. You were successful several times. How are you giving back? How are you educating others? How are you making society a better place? And, and those are the things that, that uh, you start caring about more and more and more. And, and part of what we're trying to do both at Celsius and other initiatives I have is really making sure that we're impacting people's lives, right? Like, so, our mission at Celsius is to help people achieve financial independence, achieve financial freedom. And, and those have to do with you earning enough to pay for your daily bills, right? That's, we're not trying to make you a billionaire. We're just trying to get you to the point where you don't have to worry every day, every month about how you're gonna pay your bills, right? And when you're in that state, then you can do many, many things that most of us just not even thinking are possible. So th those are the things that I'm focused on right now. And I'm, you know, I try to do charities. I try to do whatever, sit on boards. Like that doesn't do anything. You want impact, you got to go and work and, and create that impact with others. Yeah, even a little windfall makes a big difference. And I love the way that you celebrate others, you elevate others. You've obviously learned the same lesson I learned from my own father who gave me a jacket with no pockets and told me, you do not want to be the richest man in the cemetery. You can't take anything with you when you're gone. No one's going to print your bank account uh, balances on your, on your tombstone, as you suggested. Uh, but instead, let's elevate, empower, and celebrate one another by providing abundance. And that little bit of windfall, all we need is, you've heard it so many times because you grew up poor like me. If I just could get a little bit of air, what, what I could do. And I'm certainly glad that you found that air because you certainly have uh, taken advantage of all the different benefits and blessings in both of our lives. And the world would not be the same without Alex Machinsky, founder and CEO of Celsius Network. Thanks for joining me. Mm -hmm.